no, oh, yeah, okay, now there you go. yeah, sorry, it like flashes and gets crazy for there for a minute. Okay. <laughs> All right. So um we're going to talk about learning disorders today, but as part of this, I'm also going to talk a little bit about sort of the educational process and IEPs, individualized education plans, um, because understandably kids who have learning problems then also really benefit from support in school. And so I know you've probably heard us all talking about IEPs and ETRs when you're listening to us um, with families. So I just want to make sure we get a little bit more detail about that. So. Um, this will be not only sort of medical um, learning disorders, but also a little bit about the educational side of that too. Um, a little bit of background on me and the reason you guys are hearing this for me is um, I have my master's in special education. Um, so I worked in the classroom setting before medical school. Um, and then um, now I am the physician in the school success clinic. So I know um, because we just restarted that clinic and we're doing, we're having limitations on the number of people that can be involved just because of um, COVID and only allowing six people in the exam room, et cetera. Um, we are, you guys probably haven't had a chance to be a part of that clinic. But keep in mind that that is an option um, down the road, especially when we're able to expand a little bit more, um, see more patients in school success and do a little bit more with people observing. Um, so that's why um, you guys get this lecture um, from me. Um, and please let me know if you have interest in school success and we can try to make that happen down the road if it isn't something that fits right now. Um, again, we only can have six people in the conference room, so I actually usually call in for that. So I'm not even physically present because we have, there's just not enough space for that right now, but we're working on it. So it should start to get a little bit better. So let's talk first about the medical side uh, really of specific learning disorders. And this is what, from the DSM-5. So when we're talking sort of medically about learning problems, we're looking at difficulties learning and using academic skills um, by the presence of at least one of the following symptoms for at least six months. Um, this is looking at specific learning symptoms. So we're looking at reading. So either inaccurate reading or slow reading um, understanding the meaning of what you're read, reading. That's more like comprehension. We hear that a lot from parents that like they can read, but they don't know, understand anything that they're reading. We're looking at spelling. We're looking at actual writing, um, the fine motor that goes with writing, but also the ability to sort of use complete sentences and space your words and put all your thoughts together in writing. And then we're looking at math. Math is looking at sort of basic math skills, like master numbers but also sort of math reasoning, math problem solving. And um, understandably, math can be a little bit complicated because as math becomes more complicated, a lot more reading becomes involved in math. And so then someone who has a difficulty with reading, you might start seeing math difficulties when there's word problems, for example. So when we're looking at um, sort of making a, di a medical diagnosis of a specific learning disorder, we're looking at what I call the difference between potential and performance. So the way it's worded in the DSM-5 is looking at the affected academic skills are substantially and quantifiably below expectation. And so when I think about expectations, I think about potential, and that's really thinking about IQ. So someone's like brain potential or potential to do well, is their IQ or what we would expect of them at that age. And then when we're looking at performance, those are those academic skills I was just talking about. So we're looking at there to sort of be a significant difference between what someone's capable of, meaning their IQ, and what they're actually doing, meaning their reading score. So the reason we sort of specify that medically is because if we do an IQ test on someone and their IQ is significantly below average, then we would expect them to have below average reading scores too, right? for example. So usually your potential and your performance are about the same. Understandably, that makes sense, right? So when we're looking at a specific learning disorder, we're looking at sort of the, the difference there and that there is a significant difference there. And like it says here, it's usually an early on, early school years, um, meaning early reading skills, early math skills, but sometimes you don't really notice a difference until it's the academic demands are a little bit harder. And this is definitely more obvious in math when reading is the problem with math because math doesn't become a 
marketing problem until word pro problems come into play, which is sometimes down the road. <laughs> okay. Um, so when we do sort of an uh, um, a medical diagnosis with this, we're looking for that gap between potential and performance in reading, writing, or math. So that's really how it's written out medically is a specific learning disorder with impairment in reading, with impairment in writing, or with impairment in math, depending on where that um, sort of gap exists um, in academic performance. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about dyslexia. Um, especially when it comes to the educational criteria for a diagnosis or eligibility is actually the wording for educational because schools are less likely to call something dyslexia, namely because the way the law is written, they don't necessarily have to treat dyslexia. So they might not use the word dyslexia. They might just say a specific learning disorder in reading or writing and not call it dyslexia. Where on the medical side, we might be more likely to call it dyslexia. And in that case, the family just seeks services outside of the school district if they're looking for something um, dyslexia specific, which if it comes as a medical diagnosis, insurance often pays for it. So, <laughs> so this is a little bit more um, where diagnosis versus eligibility is different when we're thinking medically versus educationally, right? So when we're thinking of a diagnosis, that's a medical diagnosis of a learning disorder, but that doesn't necessarily mean someone is eligible for school services. Mm -hmm. So someone who is has a learning disorder from us, the school still has to determine if it's educational need. Um, so there's an educational definition of a specific learning disability. And that sort of takes away that like IQ test. It sort of takes away that like gap between potential and performance. And that's where school is really looking at the academic part of it. Is this child really struggling in reading sort of regardless of what they um, are expected to be doing based on their IQ? They're looking really at its manifestation in the classroom. Can this child not, is this child supposed to be in fourth grade and they cannot do the fourth grade work, right? So they're looking really educationally in the classroom. Is this child unable to function because of a specific um, academic area, meaning like math, reading, or writing specifically. Um, and they, school, of course, wants to make sure it's not something else, right? So they're always going to have, and I'll show you a, a screenshot of what this looks like on paper. They're going to make sure it's not because of vision, hearing, some sort of motor disability. They are they are going to make sure it's not a cognitive impairment, emotional disturbance, like other things. So it's sort of like check off that it's not other things and this child is really still struggling with this academic area and that's where it's educational um, eligibility, less so of a diagnosis. And again, I, I think I already just said this, it doesn't really require that discrepancy between intellectual ability and achievement. It's not worded that way. They certainly do IQ testing, but it's not sort of worded specifically like it is for us um, medically. Mm -hmm. And the reason this is important in the classroom is because the school can use uh, this sort of idea of a child struggling in reading to put some specific interventions in place before even saying it's a learning disability. So they're saying this child is struggling. They're saying this child needs help in reading. They can start right away by doing some interventions. This is called um, response to intervention or RTI. You may have heard us use those terms too. It's really looking at providing support in the classroom before calling it a disability, before putting an IEP in place to see if this child just needs a little bit more support or a little bit of a different form of instruction. And there's usually different tiers to it. So there might be a little bit of support in tier one, tier two steps it up a little bit, tier three means they need to have an IEP and they're probably gonna call it a specific learning disability. So it's sort of a stepwise fashion before they jump to making a, a child have an IEP or give it sort of a specific um, diagnosis, which can be confusing for us as physicians because we often think like this child has a problem, give them, get them some help, but the school probably is helping. It just is in this like tiered fashion that I don't think parents always realize is actually happening. Mm -hmm. um, again, I think I talked about this a little bit already too, a learning disorder, it, you cannot have a learning disorder if it's just because you're a non-English speaker and English is the problem. So obviously you need to work on language before you would call it a learning disability. 
ADHD, um, if someone's just not paying attention and they can't stay focused to be able to demonstrate their skills, like that's not a learning disorder. You have to stay in it first. School will not call it a learning disorder if the child is truant and misses a lot of school. You can't miss school and then and then not learn something and call it a learning disorder. <laughs> Other things, internalizing difficulties like anxiety, similar to ADHD, someone who's anxious and isn't really paying attention to school, but is just like nervous the whole time. We have to work on that anxiety piece first. Um, and then we're always a little bit leery of someone who was fine. And then like all of a sudden grades drop. We're always wondering like, what externally might be happening if this child has the ability to learn and then just isn't. So those are things that we that we take into consideration before we would call it, especially school would call the learning disorder. So let's talk a little bit specifically about these individual disorders. Uh, reading disorder to start. This is the uh, one we hear of probably the earliest because reading is sort of drilled in very early on in our academics. And kids with reading disorders, thinking back, the parents often recall early speech and language problems. Um, so that can certainly contribute to reading disorder. There's early trouble just learning letters, like learning the alphabet and then coordinate, uh, uh, sort of understanding the connection between letters and sounds, often putting like multiple letters together to make a sound. That's where there's trouble with phonemic awareness there, like putting letters and sounds together and being able to use those in a new way, like in a brand new word, know that those sounds are the same thing. Um, kids then um, struggle with reading fluency because they can't sound out words, so their reading is kind of choppy. And if you're in a not a fluent reader, comprehension is hard because you're, you're not like remembering what you read because you were trying so hard to sound out the words or to read fluently. And I already mentioned this too, obviously down the road after you have a reading problem, you have a hard time reading math word problems and you have a hard time spelling for the same reason. If you hear a new word and you don't know what the letters and sounds mean, you have a hard time sort of putting that down on paper. Um, about 9% of the population um, has reading disorders and it runs in families, um, just like a lot of things that we talk about. So there's usually a parent in, um, or sibling who also has a reading difficulties, which makes us um, think, you know, the way we deliver our information to families is important because if we're sort of dealing with a child who has a reading disorder and then we hand mom like a bunch of paperwork about reading disorders, we have to think, is mom really able to sort of comprehend what we're handing her? Um, a little bit more common in males than females, um, but, also similarly more common for those males to have ADHD or other uh, like sort of difficulties academically for other reasons. And this definitely um, presents early because like I said, reading is sort of like the foundation of our academics that starts very early kindergarten years. Um, so we don't usually see as much of a rise in this later, although I will say because of the, um, you may have heard us talk about this too, the third grade reading guarantee, it's a state test that children have to pass in third grade. Um, third grade becomes a, a bit of a stressful year for kids who have sort of struggled a little bit all along and then all of a sudden have to pass the state test. So we sometimes see it sort of a third grade um, rise in concerns about reading, mostly related to that test. <laughs> So the important thing to do for reading and literacy instruction, just like almost everything that we work with is start early, right? So the earlier you notice someone struggling with reading, the earlier we can get them services. You'll see listed here a couple of uh, specific tutoring programs for early reading instruction. Orton, Gillingham, and Wilson are um, named there. Those are specific dyslexia tutoring services. This is where dyslexia um, gets a little bit funny because schools don't always have someone trained in Orton Gillingham or Wilson. These are multi-sensory approaches to learning and basically starting over with like the foundations of letter recognition and sound because that's what the issue is usually early letter recognition and sound. So this is where if school isn't gonna offer a specific dyslexia services, they're going to offer some reading services, which is great and fine and they should do that. But if someone actually meets criteria for dyslexia, then um, private services can offer, or in Gillingham or Wilson, the Masons, it's their philanthropy, um, dyslexia is their, well, their philanthropy project. So they have multiple locations in the state of Ohio that offer tutoring services 
dyslexia. Um, it depends on where you live, if it's conveniently located or not. And it, they have a long wait list, but once you're in, it's for two years of tutoring. I think they have like a sliding scale tuition, um, so it's not terribly expensive for everyone. And if you have a medical diagnosis, then sometimes the parents will pay for it. So often families um, will continue their school support with reading support and then seek specific dyslexia support outside of school. Again, school is not going to call it dyslexia if they don't have someone to treat dyslexia. Um, and so they're going to call it a reading disorder. And so that's sort of what they would focus on. And then privately, we could focus on the other things. Um, and obviously, reading intervention, if comprehension is an issue, there's specific strategies to work on comprehension. Um, and importantly, there can be specific accommodations in school to allow someone more time if they're like a slower reader or they need to reread, right? If someone has a really difficult time reading, there might be someone that can read test questions to them, for example, so that it, they can complete it in a more uh, appropriate time. They can have a time to read to themselves out loud. Sometimes they can hear it better. Um, school just has to give them space to do that. They can listen to audiobooks and read along. Um, and just some simple accommodations like that can be really helpful for someone who has difficulties with reading. And the reason we care so much about reading is because there's a lot of areas where we can intervene, right, to become a skilled reader. So this is just an, a nice graphic to show that there's early language um, comprehension, literacy, uh, vocabulary, and then reading, recognizing words, spelling words, decoding, putting all of those things together be, to become a skilled reader. And so there can be a breakdown in any one of these areas, right? So if there's a breakdown in language, then maybe a speech pathologist working with someone would be helpful. If there's a breakdown in, in some of these, the word recognition, those are some breakdowns that are more common in something like dyslexia, where you have totally normal speech and language, but you have a hard time with some of those other reading strategies. And so there can be breakdown anywhere. And so that's why we look at sort of all these different things and, and put support in place for wherever there happens to be a gap so that someone can become a skilled reader. Dr. Branch. Yeah. Um, the slide before, when you were talking about the different um, like accommodations you can provide yeah. versus like maybe the more formal um, workups, is that something that you would uh, look to provide like a 504 yeah. for yeah. as opposed to just an IEP? Totally. So those could definitely be a 504 because, and I, I think I have a slide coming up that talks a little bit about those differences between a 504 and IEP mm -hmm. because a 504 plan is actually from, from a different law than IEP. And it's a little bit more like, um, can be more medical, but definitely less um, actual change to curriculum, meaning the accommodations are in place that you have extra time, but you're still learning the same thing. So you're still reading the same book, but someone reads it to you, right? So you're learning the same thing. So the curriculum isn't different. And that is exactly what a 504 plan is for, is to give someone sort of accommodations, changes to like the environment and their ability to access the curriculum, but not changing the curriculum. Got it. So yeah, yeah, that's perfect example of, an, of a 504. Cool. And in this specific example, it could that could also be something that goes along into what I talked about briefly before that response to intervention, RTI, where mm -hmm. there's different mm -hmm. tiers of support. So if a school does RTI, not all schools do, but if a school does some RTI, that might mean their first level of support is someone reads to you, your second level of support, right? So it might be along that tier of what they offer. But yeah, exactly. Having something um more specifically to the student in a 504 plan would be perfect. Got it. Yeah. And the same thing can happen for any of these, for any of these disorders. If it's just accommodations, it could be a 504 plan. Yeah. So um, writing disorders. So this one, we see a lot of overlap with reading and, and understandably, because if you look back at, at some of this, um, if you don't understand the vocabulary or structure of language, or you have a hard time with words, like that's hard to write those things too, right? So if you have a hard time with reading, you probably, um, and, and it's likely that you would have a hard time with some writing. So this is where um, we look at specific things with dyslexia too, with spelling and comprehension. It's hard to write down your thoughts and answers if you didn't understand what you read, right? So you can just understand how that overlap exists. The other thing with writing is just like that reading. I don't have a picture of like a weave like that, but there are so many steps to writing, right? So 
you have to actually think about what you're going to write. You have to plan like where to put letters on the paper. You have to be able to hold a pen or pencil, or I guess nowadays it's a lot of typing. You have to then write and continue to think about what you were writing and not, you know, like not forget and like do it in a reason. Like there's just so much that goes into it. And so just like reading, there can be a breakdown. I think I have this, this is up here. Like the breakdown could be in so many different places. This is where if it's a language problem, like you don't understand the words and the language, um, spelling, if you have a hard time reading, this is where something like ADHD or anxiety could come into play too. Because if you're not paying attention to what you're writing or you're spacing or um, you're nervous about doing it, like there can be something else contributing. Also important to keep in mind too, the mechanics of writing, like there could be someone with a fine motor problem that needs like OT or something for actually writing. Um, for writing, it's obviously really important, like down the road too. And so I think it's important for people to know that like, when you're going to apply for a job, you have to be able to like put together a resume. Like there's things that, that you constantly have to be writing. Um, and so it's an important skill to sort of master before leaving school. And it's not just in like writing class, right? Like you have to write in math. You have to write in every class that you take. You have to write essays in history class. You have to write in science class, right? So you have to be able to sort of use this skill um, throughout your academic career in all sorts of all different academic classes. Although, I mean, I know there's a lot out there now with like typing and some kids do better with that, which is something that again, could be like a 504. Um, if, if someone did a better job typing, we sometimes ask schools to allow someone to type if that's easier for them. Um, we don't have as um, much information about prevalence. And I think that's just because of the combination with reading disorder, probably about 10%. Uh, but again, because they're together, we see them, we don't know. It's harder to find someone who just has a writing. But I already mentioned this too. Someone with ADHD, they might make more mistakes, not pay attention to their writing. So you really have to consider that kind of um, treatment if you're worried about that contributing to writing. And some skills for um, writing, um, self-monitoring. Um, if it's something like ADHD, you want to be able to increase like organizational skills and just do specific things like highlighters, different colors, like graphically organize your writing. Our speech pathologists do a lot of work with some of our teens on some writing techniques and they use a lot of this mapping. So they are like, a, I think they call it a web when they do it, where you put like your main idea in the middle and then you have like your uh, supporting ideas and then being able to translate like a visual like that to an actual paragraph can be beneficial. Again, organizer map web, something like that to help with actual writing skills and translating that to a uh, paragraph form. It can be helpful for all kids, honestly. I think we all learned that in elementary school, but some kids probably need this a lot more than others. Um, math disorders. So again, it's really important to pay attention to, is it the math or is it the reading that goes along with math? Because it can be the math part. It can be a hard, just like it's hard for some kids to learn that like a letter makes a sound. It can be hard for kids to realize a number represents a quantity. So sometimes it is really that like basic math, like counting, ordering that one and one to one correspondence, like this number one equals one of something else. And so if they have a hard time with those basic concepts, like I said, the understanding um, right to left things in order, one to one correspondence, you obviously struggle then later with other math skills, adding, subtracting even harder with other um, higher level skills. But then again, some kids present when it's only word problems, and then we have to just make sure that it's not the reading part. That that so if you read the word problem to them, could they actually do the math part? Um, we don't see as much referral for math problems as we do for reading. But I think, again, there's just such a heavy emphasis on reading early on in school that that's something we're definitely going to see sooner than the math problems. And because it can be, you know, it can be that reading that is the problem. Um, like you said, comorbid with reading disorders and kids who have language problems, ADHD, you know, visual spatial can be hard for um kids who have like visual spatial difficulties, because if you think about like um, geometry, for example, like shapes and things on paper can be hard or even like 3D things like blocks. So that can be harder for kids. Um, again, probably runs in families, but we don't really have as much information about that. 
what do we do about it? Just like everything else, we want to sort of treat it as soon as we possibly notice that there's an issue and sort of restarting over just like we would with reading to start with those basic facts, meet kids where they are. Do they need to relearn the number line? Do they need to relearn ordering? That kind of thing. Um, sort of working through some visual aids can be really helpful. A lot of that like multi-sensory hands-on learning, like, like you mentioned blocks, you know, using blocks for counts. Lots of those things help. Um, having lots of examples um, and, like I said, sort of visualizing and making it hands on can be really helpful. So, I think I talked about this a little bit already, but this is where um, I think it can be confusing for what school is actually doing, where we use that discrepancy model where there's a difference between IQ and achievements. Like I said, school might notice that there's a difficulty just with reading and then they start putting some supports in place so they don't necessarily have like a reading disorder but school is giving them a chance to respond to a little bit more support so they give them a chance by sort of changing how they teach the curriculum to that child and if they do well with that change in instruction then they they just did fine and they move right along and so they keep track of how well a child responds to their interventions. But again, just because this, they're struggling doesn't mean school isn't doing something. Just because they don't have an IEP doesn't mean that they're not doing something. They might be doing, like sort of following their tiered model of intervention. And this always gets kind of funny. Schools like hate when we say give this child an IEP, right? The school has to determine on their own if the child needs help educationally, right? So we're never gonna like prescribe an IEP. We can tell the family, you could ask your school to evaluate him. School might say he's doing just fine. We don't need to evaluate him and that's fine. It has to, again, be an educational need. And so the school is going to look at the, how that child's functioning in the classroom before they were to sort of jump doing an IEP. It's frustrating, though, because a lot of times we are like, just do it. They need an IEP. And then schools like don't necessarily agree. But again, they have the right. They and, and the law is written that they have to determine that on their own. Um, so that leads me into, I just have a couple of slides about IEPs and special education, um, because I think it can be a little bit um, confusing about how that process works. So an individualized education plan, um, there's sort of a, a lot that goes into being able to qualify for that and then the actual sort of building of that IEP for an individual student. So the first thing that has to happen is they have to ha do have like a whole bunch of testing done, right? So you may have heard us talk about the EPR, that's the evaluation team report. That is all the testing that they do on a student to determine whether they qualify for an IEP or not. Um, this is, in, and the reason it's called the multi-factored evaluation is because it's all these things. So it's behavioral observations, it's IQ testing, it's academic testing. They look at speech and OT if that's an issue. They look at, at gross motor uh, PT if they need to. Um, they look at, they talk to the family, there's medical information, there's like a whole bunch of information that goes into this. It's a giant report if you've seen any of them. And then after all of that is done, then they determine whether a child qualifies for an IEP or not. That testing, that ETR, that happens every three years. But the IEP is renewed every year. So every year it's at least gone over whether the child still sort of needs that and whether the goals need to be um, changed. This is super busy slide, I know, but <laughs> this is a little bit of a timeline. So there's a, there's a, the law is written in a way that gives schools some time to do this. So the only people that can request an IEP, at least request that the school evaluate for an IEP, is a parent or guardian or the school itself. So that's why we can't do it anyway. We can we can teach parents to ask for it. So it has to be a, an in writing. So the parent has to say, like, please evaluate my child for special education services. Signed parent with a date. Because the, the school has to respond to that request within 30 days. So the response could be like, no, your child's doing fine, right? But they at least have to respond in 30 days. Or it might be like, okay, we'll do this. We're going to start with X, Y, Z testing. If they decide to do it, then they have 60 days to complete their testing and determine if the child qualifies. 
So when you put all of that together, that's 90 days. So that it seems lengthy um, to parents. I don't think it usually goes that long. If a school says, yes, they're going to do it, it doesn't necessarily take them 60 days, but the law is written that they're allowed to have that whole like 90 days to get it done. So then school determines whether or not the child qualifies for an IEP. So this is where an IEP versus a 504 or nothing is what they determine after that giant testing process. When they do qualify for an IEP, um, this is a page that you would see in the um, ETR. So after they do their testing, this is where if there is, you see at the top of this says documentation for determining a specific learning disability. And so they would have to check off where the child was struggling. So you look, they can either say it's a specific learning disability in reading, fluency, reading, comprehension, writing, reading, writing, those things are listed there. So they have to determine which area the child is struggling in, which area they are calling a specific learning disability. And like I said before, they have to check off that it's not these other things. So they're going to say it's not because of these other things. And then you're going to see section four is called is the eligibility determination. So eligibility is basically school's term for diagnosis. So they're going to determine what this child is eligibility, what their services, how they're eligible for services. So specific learning disorder is one thing that it could be. So this is one of the first pages I look at when I'm reviewing ETRs, I always want, and maybe I shouldn't because I'm like jumping to the conclusion, but I always check <laughs> that I, I, I turn to section four to see like, what did they determine this child was eligible for? Because there's only 13 things they can choose. These are the only things that can be on that section. So they can only say it's autism, deafness, blah, blah, one of these things. Obviously, you see that uh, specific learning disability is on there. So just because of that's what this lecture is about, that's what we would see here for eligibility determination. And then you would flip back to section three to see which areas they felt were the area that that child was having learning disorder. Um, you will see on here, there are some things on this list that are um, sort of medically diagnosed, right? Like there would have to be some documentation that the child had an orthopedic impairment or a visual impairment, right? So some of these do come from a med the medical side of things. You'll see one on here um, that's uh, pretty vague, other health impaired. We call that OHI, -O OHI, other health impaired. A lot of our kids with ADHD can qualify for an IEP under something like OHI. So there are some kids who have like a medical diagnosis that doesn't necessarily fall into one of these things that can still qualify for services. This is where we think a little bit more about what's the difference between an IEP and a 504. And you can see they come from different laws, right? And so the IEP is really special ed. The section 504 is from a civil rights act, uh, law. That's because it was looking more at the ability to have a child with like a disability function in the classroom, like having a ramp, for example, for a child, a child with asthma having an inhaler. So kids who had had needed access to school, but didn't need special education. So that's why those are different. But it can still be wonderful for a lot of our kids to get services. And, I, and parents are sometimes like, well, he just got a 504. It's not just got a 504. A 504 can still provide a lot of great accommodations, right? So it just means that we aren't really changing like the curriculum. There's not really like interventions, it's just accommodations. And I, this is where something like ADHD could fall under either one of these. So someone with ADHD who just needs to sit next to the teacher to have a few more reminders, but they're still learning all the same things, that's a 504. But someone with like pretty severe ADHD who also needs a change in the curriculum, they might actually qualify for an IEP. So to get more information and stay up to date, because I actually think it's important for parents to know where to get help, because I think parents have a hard time navigating this system, right? That was, it's a lot to know that school has 30 days to answer, you have to know, know in writing, and then plus if you also have a reading disorder and they give you information back and you don't know what it was, a lot of parents don't really know what their child is getting in school. Are they getting RTI? Parents are like, I don't know, what is that, right? So this website the for Ohio law and Ohio education updates, this is a great website because it's also really uh, parent friendly, right? The parents can look at this, we can look at this, like anyone can sort of get a, get a better understanding of what's happening in schools there. 
Um, and there's a lot on that website, right? So it's, it's really, it, I think it's really friendly for families and for educators and for providers, anyone who sort of needs a little bit more information. Um, then here are my references. Here are some other resources. So um, I can send you guys the this uh, PowerPoint, but I know this is also being recorded. I don't know how, if you guys will have uh, regular access to it, but the reason I like to send it out is for things like this, because this is really helpful to have some information, um, handouts for parents about RTI, some of those graphic organizers I was talking about. These are some of the ones that um, I think some of our speech pathologists use. Um, just some other like resources on IEPs, on specific learning disabilities. These are places you guys can look if you had questions or concerns, but also you can have families turn to these websites. So I, I'll send you guys this PowerPoint, but again, um, after this is um, recorded, you guys probably will have access to it at some point anyway. That's all I have. Do you guys have questions, concerns, um, anything that you guys wanted to know more about? I just wanted to know what you taught before you got into medicine. Oh, yeah, good, great question. Um, I, so my master's is in um, special education and regular mm -hmm. education in grades one through six. So while I was doing that, I worked in actually, though, a special education preschool. So my um, morning class was early intervention. So that was like the zero to three crowd. So they had a variety of diagnoses. We had kids with Down syndrome, kids who um, had more like physical disabilities. That was the um, what I did in the morning and in the afternoon was autism. And that was preschool. So that was ages three and four, mostly um, kids with autism. The Where I worked, um, I'm from near Buffalo, New York, and that's where I did um, my master's um, at, at Canisius College there. So the school where I worked was called Buffalo Hearing and Speech. And so everyone who qualified for services at that specific center also had speech therapy. So we had a classroom with a teacher and aide and a speech pathologist. So it was really heavy on speech and language because everyone in the classroom had, had you only went there if you also had a speech and language need, which like all the kids with autism do, right? And so it wasn't that unusual, but it was just very speech and language heavy, which was awesome because it was great to have a speech and language pathologist with us all day long. We did a lot of text, like picture exchange and pointing and a lot of, um, for snack time, they had to like show a picture of what they wanted because speech was like working with them all the whole time they were there. And then I did my student teaching in a first grade class that was like a com combined class. So it was regular and, and special ed. We had six kids in that class who were on IEP. So it was a combined class. And then because I was doing regular ed and special ed, my um, second placement was in a sixth grade class that was regular ed. There was a couple of kids in there that had some accommodations. That was not my jam. I was like <laughs> almost middle school. Kids were like fighting about things on the bus. And I was just like, get me out of here. <laughs> like this, that was not for me. I was all about the little preschoolers with autism, but like sixth graders were, I mean, I, yeah. <laughs> that was, uh. So I was glad when that was done. But those kids, that population was really what drove me to actually do what I do today. Because in um, the classroom setting where I was with the preschoolers, they would see a developmental behavior pediatrician. And I was like, who is this person? Like what? Like I've never heard of that before, right? Like I don't know really why you would. And so that's when I learned about this um, specialty. Mm -hmm. And so that's sort of why I did sort of what I do now. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Anything cool. else? Yeah, I did have a question um, with, you mentioned OHI and uh, ADHD. How do we kind of bring them in? Because my understanding was ADHD doesn't really at least, I suppose it wasn't, it's not black and white, but like how would ADHD, how would we be able to justify ADHD as a learning disability? Yeah, perfect. So what on our side, what we do, I mean, I write a lot of letters that are pretty, it doesn't say like this child needs services. I just write a diagnosis letter. So if you write a, a letter that says I've seen this patient in clinic and they qualify for a diagnosis of ADHD, I usually sometimes put like a vague statement, like they may benefit from additional support and accommodations in the classroom. I always put may because I don't want to like make the school mad. But an ADHD diagnosis, the school should at least, and I know I shouldn't say at least because it's helpful, but the school, an ADHD diagnosis basically should equal a 504, if anything. So a 504 
could definitely be put in place with just a diagnosis. All you need to say is ADP. What it doesn't mm-hmm. necessarily do is that IEP part, which it can, and that is up to the school. So that is up to the school. If you provide the documentation that ADHD exists, then it's up to the school sort of where that child falls along the need of support, which is frustrating, right? Because sometimes we're like, ah, oh, this kid needs so much help, but the school has to determine that on their own. So really okay. it's like, it, it's kind of put in the ball in their court after you give the diagnosis. I see.